in action presents The Pirate. This is an old-fashioned pirate, 17th century version. And this, a new mug type, 20th century version. This is a 17th century pirate ship, and this is their ammunition. This is a 20th century pirate ship, and this is their ammunition. For the past six weeks, a pirate radio ship has been transmitting pop music for 12 hours each day to the southeast of England. At six o'clock this morning, a second ship came on the air. The pirate ships are causing the Postmaster General a lot of trouble. This is the Postmaster General, the Right Honourable Reginald Devins, MP. I suppose there's always a whiff of buccaneering and adventure uh, about this sort of thing. And uh, most English people, of course, have got a sneaking weakness for piracy in any form. Uh, and of course I recognise as well as anybody that this kind of thing makes news. But I, I do think we ought to take a pretty cool look at the facts that surround all this business. And that's exactly what we intend to do in tonight's World in Action. As things are now, it's only the strictly non-commercial BBC who can broadcast radio programs in Britain. The British people, of course, are perfectly at liberty to tune into any other European stations that they feel like. That, of course, includes Radio Luxembourg, which is a strictly commercial organization. Jeffrey Everett is general manager of Radio Luxembourg in Britain. Now, the precise difference between an operation such as Radio Luxembourg and the pirate radio ships is simply this. That Radio Luxembourg, uh, on two or eight meters, are operating on a frequency which has been officially allocated to them by the international body responsible for... Uh, Wavelength. To escape the law, a pirate ship has to do two things. She has to be registered in a foreign country, not bound by international radio regulations, and she has to anchor outside British waters. Radio Caroline, four and a half miles off Felixstowe, was the first of the pirate ships to beam unlicensed pop music over British shores. We found the men behind this scene in the office of that glossy magazine, Queen just around the corner from the law court. Jocelyn Stevens, editor-in-chief of Queen Magazine, is joint managing director with 23-year-old Irishman Ronan O'Rahilly of the company which sells advertising time for Radio Caroline. Time for Radio Caroline. Chris Moore is the program controller of Radio Caroline and Ian Roth sales executive. Ronan O'Reilly, the originator of Radio Caroline, begins at the beginning. The, the Dutch the people were responsible for the picking of the vessel to make sure it was. There are a lot of requirements, as you can imagine, that it, it, it has to stand up to certain gale forces off the coast during the winter. Uh, then the, the ship w was brought to Green Ore. We got um, complete cooperation over there in Ireland. My father is uh, in the shipping business across the channel from Green Ore to Preston. He, he took the port over from, from the British Railways. It became derelict about 15 years ago, I think it was. And um, he, said, he said to us that we wanted a port that was quite cloak and dagger arrangement. It began, it began to get a little difficult when uh, this 168-foot mast was, 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 uh, was erected. No. The interesting thing was, was that, that, that Caroline arrived at uh, Off Harwich at 6 p.m. on the Good Friday, which was almost exactly six months after the operation had really got underway. And, uh, Put out a testing rule at 9 p.m. that night. On Easter Saturday, March the 28th, Radio Caroline's first broadcast descended on Britain like a bolt from the blue. It had been a well-kept secret. But there was another surprise to come. 
A second pilot radio ship with a different group of backers was nearing completion. This was Radio Atlanta. Alan Crawford, 42-year-old Australian music publisher, is the boss behind this outfit. On his board of directors, you'll find such important citizens as Oliver Smedley, well-known liberal and businessman with interest in city press newspapers. Major G.C. Lomax, publisher and Lloyd's underwriter. And F.C. Broadrid, financial director to a well-known company. The ship on which the Radio Atlantic group pinned their hopes was now in Greenorth, the harbour owned by Ronan O'Reilly's father. In great secrecy, we were taken to this port just beneath the mountains of Mourne and 60 miles north of Dublin. The 270-ton Mi Amiga is the ship carrying Radio Atlanta. Built in 1921 in Germany, she was used as a coaster until 1961, when a film producer and a Texan millionaire ran her as one of the first pirate radio ships off the coast of Sweden. But in May 1962, the Swedish parliament said no, and Radio Nor was rudely silent. Now, two years later, she's been fitted out for the same piratical job, this time off Britain. There are eight in the crew, two Dutch deckhands, Lane and Yab, a Polish cook who just escaped from behind the Iron Curtain, another ex-Pole who was chief engineer, a Dutch second engineer called Tony, a radio technician known as Texas, who came from Dallas. A chief mate from Holland. And Mark Odovsky, the captain, who was a British naturalized Pole. When we arrived at Grenoble, the Miamigo and her crew had already been there five weeks. Recent events at Grenoble had begun to put a strain on the relationship between the rival pirate groups Caroline and Atlanta. Patrick Shields, O'Reilly's foreman at Grenoble, explained. Oh, well, the Caroline was here first, you see. The, the me and me go lay outside, you see, and she went out. Because we got enough three ships in the death of the ones at the same time, you see. As a matter of fact, then, the, the, she, the, she, she was anchored outside the me and me go, and she dragged, she dragged, she dragged her anchor. You know what I mean? The, the, and she was on and up in the sandbank. Got her off the sandbank again, all right, and I ate tight. Decided to take her in, so they took her in and uh, anchored her in the, in the dock here. Ah, well, it's a good port, you know. Uh, you could get them fitted out here. You know. The Radio Atlanta group weren't quite so enthusiastic about Grenoble. Alan Crawford. Oh yes, it, it, it took a great deal longer than uh, we had hoped because the uh, there is always a certain anxiety in getting a project like this underway. And uh, I think we merely ran into the happy Irish go-lucky uh, way of life there, that's all.